Um, yeah, so I have two degrees in psychology, but at the Missouri School of Journalism, um, I, was, I really didn't really study journalism. They actually had one of the only media psychophysiology labs in the country. So when I Googled media psychology, PhD, and the Missouri School of Journalism came up, I knew that's where I needed to go to be trained to do the research that I'm going to present here today. Uh, so I'm going to present a series of studies, and then I'm going to go into one specific study that was recently published in APA's Media Psychology, which is the fourth ranked journal uh, in our field, in the field of communication. So uh, one of the scenarios I like to at least have you imagine for a second before we kind of dive into this is uh, just for a second, consider that you're a smoker, you smoke traditional cigarettes, and for whatever reason, uh, you find yourself smoking near a playground where children are playing. And a stranger, probably one of those, um, uh, probably a parent or one of the children playing, walks up to you and says, do you realize you're smoking is not only harming these innocent children, but it's also killing you. You should quit smoking or at least do it somewhere else. Okay, so imagine that scenario. What's your response to that? One response could be, I'm sorry, okay, I didn't realize there were children. I nodded here and you just avoid, right, that conversation. Second scenario could be, or second response would be, you get angry and you counter argue. Who are you to tell me what I can and can't do and where I can do it? And I grew up in a house where my parents smoked. I'm okay. Those children are going to be just fine. Leave me alone. Okay. Well, in reality, mass media messages, anti-tobacco PSAs in particular, pretty much present this type of information, right? They threaten the target audience, in this case, a smoker, and um, and in some cases, it's highly unpleasant, highly aversive, and there's typically two responses that can occur: fight or flight. And so, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Some of you know your answer A, and some of you might say, eh, I'm probably B. Right? So much of my research explores how audiences, message recipients, potentially process uh, health campaign <coughs> messages. And I use self-report, so we ask some questions after each message. But we also employ psychophysiological measures, heart rate, skin conductance, facial EMG. And those responses are recorded during the message. Right? They're moment by moment, per second. And, that, and those measures are indices of attention and emotion. And so what we're able to do using this toolkit, really, is to assess what type of message content um, may elicit more or less emotion, positive or negative emotional responses, what's more arousing. And by identifying that content, we can begin to make recommendations for what might make an effective health campaign message that might promote health. Uh, and so that the, the broad goal of my research is to be able to make recommendations on what type of content we should use in a variety of health PSAs so in this case, anti-tobacco PSAs for today, in terms of capturing and sustaining attention to the message, uh, increasing uh, positive attitudes and emotion, making sure the message is remembered, uh, and all of these are kind of the initial stages of persuasion. Right? So if you're not familiar with psychophysiological responses, there's a series of assumptions that make. But one of those assumptions is that the mind produces thoughts that can be measured through bodily responses, right? This is not dualism, okay? This is good. So when we watch a scary movie, right, and our palms begin to be sweaty and arousal, that's not arbitrary. The mind is producing a bodily response. And so we make the assumption that through measurement of bodily responses, we can measure something meaningful that's happening in the mind. And so we receive information, right? It goes through a series of sub-processes, um, either effortfully or automatically. And the body sends signals, or the brain sends signals to the rest of the brain, and we measure those signals, right? So what are the things we measure? Um, I measure uh, cognitive resources allocated to encoding uh, uh, media messages through um, an invasive measure of heart rate. And that may be surprising. Right. Typically, we think fMRI, EEG. Um, several cognitive psychologists at the University of Wisconsin in the 80s found that alpha blocking, so EEG, is really highly correlated with heart rate deceleration to novel 
so for the last 20 years, we've found over and over, including Annie Lang, who's a co-author on this paper, um, our field has established that heart rate will slow down when we allocate external information. But when we engage in defensive processing, right, the sympathetic nervous system activates, the heart moves, beats faster, arousal increases, and so we see that these two nervous systems, right, influence the heart, which is being influenced by the mind, what we're perceiving. Uh, maybe more commonly, I also measure skin conductance during the message as an indicator of arousal. Um, we measure three sites in my lab for facial EMG, and so uh, we place two electrodes on right above the brow, which is called the corrugator major muscle region, and typically when we're experiencing at least negative emotion, we frown a little bit with the furrowing of the brow. Um, we can't delineate if that's disgust, fear, anger. We just know it's negative. Uh, we also measure two sites uh, for positive emotion, the orbicularis oculi under the eye and the zygomaticus major muscle region. And together, those two sites make the authentic smile, the Duchenne smile. And so now we're able to um, assess at what point in the message are we attending to, is it positive, are we smiling a little bit, are we frowning, is it arousing? And then, in most of the research um, I conduct, uh, non-physiological measures, typically uh, memory. So we want to see, okay, so you attended to it, what can you tell us about it? How well was it stored in its memory? And so we often have memory back uh, in these experiments. So uh, Andy Lang, um, I was just talking to Neil, um, her father is uh, PJ Lang at the University of Florida. I think he's retired, um, we think. Cognitive psychologist, she developed a model. Uh, she's at Indiana in the communication department called the Limited Capacity Model of Motivated Mediated Message Processing, also known as the LC4MP. And this model uh, posits that humans have a limited amount of resources uh, that can be allocated to three sub processes encoding information, storing it, and then later retrieval of that information. And these three cognitive processes are influenced by two motivational systems that Cassioppo and colleagues developed as well. Um, the first is the appetitive motivational system, and this system activates in response to pleasant things, typically food, sex, water, social belonging. Okay? And when we perceive that type of information in our environment, it's positive, we approach it, we pay more attention to it. The aversive system um, is the um, second system, and this system activates in response to unpleasant information, right? So when we see things that are threatening, right, to our survival, or even things that I've learned that are negative, the aversive system increases, and, um, and as it becomes more arousing, we actually may engage in defensive processing. So think of a time when you're watching a show or a movie, and it became so negative and so arousing, you slipped away, or you even hid your face from watching it. That's this evolutionary aversive motivational system being activated to the point of defensive processing, okay? So a few examples. These are all positive and pleasant, right? Appetitive, we may smile a little bit, somewhat arousing. And as it becomes more positive, we allocate resources to encoding that content, which would be reflected in heart rate deceleration if I were measuring it. Conversely, the aversive system ramps up much quicker when we see things that are threatening to our existence, right? It's more arousing, it's more negative, but we actually allocate more resources when it's moderately arousing until it becomes so aversive, so negative, we avoid it. We know in mass media content, not everything is positive or negative, right? And so in some cases, there are things that are coactive, okay? Right? They activate both the appetitive and the aversive motivational system. And so Annie uh, Lang and her colleagues have talked about this as co-activation. Both the appetitive and the aversive system are activated to I talk about it in terms of motivational dissonance, almost, right? So in these PSAs that I show you, they often show um, an actor or actress lighting and smoking a cigarette. For smokers, that's appetitive, that's positive, it's pleasant. Think of the incentive sensitization model of addiction. But when you show them disgust right after it, it's negative. That's the aversive system activating. And so when these two systems are activating, I think that's almost like rocking back and forth. If approached, that looks good, but maybe I should avoid it. 
so I think it's almost this motivational dissonance occurring. And one way to alleviate dissonance, as we know, is to avoid it, right? Not think about it. So the LC form P is really kind of nicely summarized in this figure. And so we'll start with those two blue lines. It's um, the dotted line is the recourse allocation, and then the follow line is repetitive amortization. And we see at a resting state here that um, humans, animals in particular, have a greater repetitive system. Right? This is called the positivity offset. Um, and this is good. This is why we leave the nest for food and water for survival. We need to do those things. And as we leave the nest and we encounter information in the environment, uh, the repetitive system continues to activate, especially when we see safe food. And we continue to approach it. We pay attention to it. And we experience those same things when we're, um, when we're shown uh, mass media messages. The bulk of my work is these red lines. So these two red lines, the solid line is aversive activation, and the dotted line is resource allocation. And we see that when we encounter negative information in our environment, the, negative, the aversive system really ramps up and it continues to ramp up as things become more arousing. But as they become more and more arousing and negative, resource allocation declines. It drops. We avoid it. Right? It's too aversive. So I, I like to think of this figure. We have a rescue dog, and when we go on walks every day, she's out in front, right, pulling me. And positivity offset. She's sniffing, she's going yard to yard on her leash. And we turn the corner, so everything's just the blue line. We turn the corner, and she identifies another dog. She stops, she orients to that new information, right, the freeze response. And as she proceeds and encodes that information, um, it becomes arousing and negative. <coughs> as that other dog begins to approach us, resources are shifted from encoding it to preparation for fight or flight. What do we do? Right? And so attention to the threat drops, and it's time to either flee, right, uh, for safety, or uh, to capture the fight. And we do, right, and we see these types of motivational systems activating and behaving this way across several, um, probably over a thousand studies in terms of LC4 and P uh, testing here at Yielding. And so the LC4 and P includes what's known as the defensive cascade model. So this is uh, Cassie Oakland colony. And again, it's very similar. Uh, this pre-encounter stage, um, positive, we're just approaching, we're searching our environment. But when we encounter a threat, um, we orient to that information, negativity bias. And as that threat gets closer, it becomes more negative, more arousing, and it's time for fight or flight. Right? And so we see this with just about all of humans, these two types of motivational systems activating in the I should say all animals. Um, Another way to think of the uh, negativity bias, aside from me walking my dog, is when we're driving on the highway and we see a car accident, right? We orient to that car accident as we're driving and getting closer, we're paying more and more attention until we get so close we see things we don't like. A body laying on the ground like us, and we look away, right? And that's, just, that's the negativity bias working and, and working in relation in terms of attention to that external information. And that's known as the defense. So research testing that we're really guided by the LC4 and P has looked at, sorry if you've already had lunch, uh, really aversive negative content in anti-tobacco PSAs. And so one of the reasons I went to Mizzou is there was a group of scholars, um, uh, Lynn Lester and Paul Bowles and Erica Thomas, who were looking at really media psychology using theories and models of psychology, cognitive psychology, and how those models might inform message processing, including the LC4 and P. And so what you're looking at here is heart rate change scores. So we measure heart rate during the message, and then we compute those, change, those scores, those values, from a baseline block period. And so the values are negative. And so um, we know that when we're allocating resources to encoding external information, heart rate really slows down. And so for ease of interpretation, it puts us more attention. Right, the lower those lines are. Okay. And so this study, they had four message conditions. They had three that were just low fear, low disgust, three that really only contained high disgust, three that had only high fear, 
found was that the high fear, high disgust, in this study, or in these messages, they looked exactly the same as the high disgust. But at about second 20, that's when fear got introduced into the message. And you see kind of this divergence in heart rate, right? As if it's beginning to accelerate a little bit, right? Maybe a little bit of attempt processing. And looking at the self-report, they see that this message condition had the most unpleasantness, the most arousal rating, and memory was worse for that condition. And so they tried to, I think they used the same messages and published again, and I think they got a clearer picture. Again, the messages that contained both attributes versus just one or the other resulted in this kind of divergent heart rate acceleration. And so we replicated it again uh, and published this in health communication, looking at discussion and discuss. So discuss, by the way, body envelope violations, death, hygiene, all this stuff. And in this case, discussion was discussion by David Sasko. And we found that when you have the two negative attributes, heart rate accelerates the most for that condition, memory drops, and that's where it has the most unpleasant message condition. So maybe, perhaps, this isn't totally surprising at all, really. Because messages, what they found here across, and what we found, was that when they did contain disgust, people pay attention to it and remember it. When they did contain fear, same thing. But when you have a two negative attribute message, it becomes so negative, so aggressive, people avoid it. Same withdrawal from it. It becomes highly arousing, highly negative, and we withdraw. So the attention is also retention? The attention is also retention. It's also memory? Uh, so attention and memory are two different variables. Yeah, so we have a memory path. Memory goes along. Exactly, so memory corroborates with the heart rate in all three of these studies. Yeah. So what we know is, though, most anti-tobacco PSAs aren't geared towards non-smokers. Many are geared towards smokers. So that's where kind of my line of work in terms of what I led came in. And so I was interested in, okay, what might keep a smoker's attention to a PSA? And so I was interested in coax messages, messages that contain both smoking cues and discuss. Smoking cues an actor uh, lighting and smoking a cigarette and are typically presented at the beginning of these videos. I think capture smokers' immediate attention to the message. It looks good, it's repetitive. And uh, what we found is in the message condition, when you're showing smoking, the smokers pay attention. But when you show discuss, you see uh, quite clearly heart rate begin to accelerate. Right? So discuss appeared at about second 20 of the video. And we still see the sense of the memory path, the memory was worse for the solid black line for the coactive messages. Again, I think in this case, um, these videos create this motivational dissonance. Right? It's like, that looks good, approach, pay attention, discuss, organ, blood, gut, okay, maybe I should quit, what do I do? Just avoid the message. So then I ask the question, well maybe, what happens if a smoker <coughs> kind of is trying to quit? and maybe they haven't smoked for two days, will those smoking cues keep their attention throughout, regardless of the discuss? Right, are those smoking cues even more salient, more repetitive? So I did a not so fun study. We ran 50 adult smokers who were instructed not to smoke for two days and put them in a withdrawn state and presented those same messages. And uh, we verified that through carbon monoxide, so biochemical verification and self-report, and we find that the sense of process is even for that same message condition. And what's kind of interesting is that if you look at the self-report smoking urge and intention to quit, we see that when you only have messages that show smoking, urge to smoke is quite high. But it decreases a little bit when the messages also contain disgust. Uh, intentions to quit are quite high when the messages only have disgust. Right? Because you're almost accepting them out of the behavior. But for the two, uh, for the message conditions that were defensively processed, we see equal levels of both wanting to smoke and wanting to quit in terms of self-report. So it's almost that, uh, that looks good, I want to smoke, but maybe I should quit. And that's even reflected in the self-report data. So this is typically what those messages look like. Smoking, right, increases smoking urge, followed by disgust. And that's how the video ends. So across five studies, we found that two negative attribute message conditions, fear and disgust, disgust, result in independent processing of non-smokers.
And we find that even with the, with smokers and when the messengers are proactive, so it becomes positive content, we still see the sense of prospecting of these messages, which likely reduces persuasion. Okay, so not attending to it and not remembering it is probably not very effective. So one of the issues I came across, right, uh, these studies, was that when I was removing the sensors off participants at the end and going through a debriefing, boy were they angry, right? They were not happy participants. And in some cases, they were counter-arguing me. And you know, that one video, you know, where they had a, a limb had to be removed. You know, I've smoked, my parents smoked for 50 years, that didn't happen to them, and this is all dramatic, right? And so I began wondering, well, anger and counter-arguments sound like this separate theory, which is known as psychological reactions theory. And so psychological reactions theory predicts that when your freedom is threatened in terms of your own behavior, you become angry, and you begin to have negative cognitions, in this case, counter arguments, and that's known as psychological reactions. And so it looks something like this, and so perhaps those smokers were not avoiding the message. Perhaps they were just getting angry and counter arguing those messages. Perhaps. And if that's true, what we see does that support the data we found? And so, right, if you ever seen something like this, someone experienced a reaction, okay? And so how does reactions integrate with this LC4MT, this with limited capacity model and motivated mediated message processing? Well, if we roll up our sleeves and begin to kind of theorize, the idea of counter-arguing, right, that's our counter-arguing, which it seems to me they were, um, is this idea of an, uh, an internal mental activity. Okay, so if you're, um, wanting to watch a commercial and you're encoding a media message and you begin to have other thoughts or begin to develop those thoughts, your cognitive resources are being reallocated from the message to developing those thoughts, right? You only have so many, right? It's limited. And so in terms of kind of this internal dialogue, these internal mental activities, Paul Bowles and George Lane found that when people engage in internal dialogues with themselves during media exposure, attention to the message and memory of the message Right, their attention is elsewhere. And we found the same thing in a 2017 study. And so we believe that counter-arguing would likely appear the same as heart rate avoidance. Meaning that if they're counter-arguing, resource allocation, meaning heart rate deceleration, would be less because their resources are being allocated to this internal dialogue, which would be most likely than less heart rate deceleration. Which we have assumed across a series of studies and those before us have always assumed this message avoidance. So again, we said this is defensive processing, message avoidance. That's what the LC4MT predicts. LC4MT <coughs> will support it. Heart rate accelerates. But if you look at a recent study where we um, had people uh, engage in social comparisons of mediated targets, right? The act of comparing yourself to someone else also resulted in less heart rate deceleration. And not only when you engage in social comparisons with someone else, when you engage in temporal comparisons with yourself, you still see less attention to the message. Okay? So it's quite clear that if we begin to have internal dialogue, such as the case of kind of arguing, we might get something very similar to this. Right? So maybe there's two explanations, theoretical explanations for those findings, other than just what the LC form to you might have to believe. So how do these two theories integrate? Right? This was a theoretical piece. Uh, dealing with Annie Lane, so she was, uh, she developed the LC4MT and Brian Twitch is really a well-known reactance researcher in our field. And so it's quite nice to have two top-notch people studying and really developing these models kind of agree on the cohesiveness and the utility of uh, uh, integrating both. And so the LC4MT predicts that defensive, when defensive processing uh, occurs, um, it tends to lead to highly arousing, highly aversive, highly negative messages. But the LC forum T really only talks about these outcomes in terms of message avoidance. Well, we know there's two sides of that coin. It's not just um, flight, there's also fight. And so PRT provides the LC forum T with those measures to be able to delineate are people fighting against the measure, experiencing uh, message, experiencing reactions, or are they just fleeing? And so we sought to test that, right? This was a theoretical test. And so in either case, we predicted that we should observe the same cognitive, right? So if they're counter-arguing, attention to the message and memory should be low. 
Or if they're avoiding the other conditions of nitrogen, then we should be low. Either case, reactance is negative, so is the content, <coughs> and we should see the same physiological pattern as is the case with carburetes. But going back to kind of the title of this presentation, right, and the scenario I, I asked you guys to imagine, the question was, if this is all happening, who is fighting and who is fleeing, right? And so we uh, have an individual trait measure called the motivation activation measure. And um, participants view and rate pictures from the IR, which are a little outdated, but there's violent sexual stuff, right? This is a full board IRB application um, because of the IR. And so you might, um, so after each image, you're asked to rate how pleasant it was, how unpleasant it was, and how arousing it was. So for me, I may see a picture of skydiving, which is actually one of the pictures. I would say, oh, that's pretty pleasant. Not that unpleasant, pretty arousing. That probably says something about me. I might be a risk taker. Whereas you may see it and say, that was terrible. Why would anyone jump out of a parachute on a plane? Uh, that's not at all pleasant, super unpleasant, and uh, somewhat arousing. You may be someone who likes to avoid threats. Okay? And so what we created is a defensive system activation and a petitive system <coughs> activation based off those ratings of those images. It should be noted, you might be asking yourself, that sounds like sensation seeking, right? High appetitive system activation, right? Saying snakes are positive and not negative. It's probably, and it is, highly correlated with a, a trait measure of sensation seeking. And so based off that measure, we had two categories, high ASA, low DSA, so high appetitive system activation, low defensive system activation. And we classified these as our risk takers. Such that if they're threatened, they're more likely to get angry and kind of argue. Who are you to tell me what I can't do? Right, I don't want to do it. But those who are of high DSA, the more defensive and less risk taking, they're probably saying, I'm sorry, okay, I didn't realize there are children all week. Okay? And they're probably our risk avoider. Again, whether or not you're a risk taker or risk avoider, you should observe these same right outcomes. And so this is just an illustration. Uh, that we publish. It's not an actual model for structural equation or anything like that. But generally, you have aversive, freedom threatening, health PSA, and if they're really arousing and unpleasant, that's aversive system activation, you may flee, which will reduce attention to the message, right? Or you can experience reacting, you can get angry, counter arguing, and fight. But again, the notion of counter arguing the message should, should still result in less attention to your memory. But perhaps there's an individual difference such that those who are risk takers are more likely to be fighting, and those who are the risk avoiders are more likely to flee. And so that's what we're generally testing theoretical models. So the study I'm presenting here, like I said, uh, was just uh, uh, accepted for publication. So in this study, we pre tested anti tobacco ads um, to, um, uh, in terms of whether or not they vary in smoking cue depiction and accurate lighting of smoking cigarettes. So half of the uh, PSA showed that and half did not. And then health threat content. We wanted to make sure the messages contained health threat content, that they were threatening. And so we ended up with four message conditions, but the one we were most interested in is the ones that contain smoking cues and health threats. Okay? These are our co-acting messages. They show smoking and then a negative outcome. And so this condition communicates that if you smoke, as shown here, you're harming yourself and others, so that's a health threat, and that should be a threat to freedom. Going back to that same scenario, right? We got messages to match that um, scenario. So our participants, 52, uh, are recruited somewhere around these parts. Um, 52 doesn't sound like a lot, but in these psychophysiology uh, experiments, it's, uh, it's typically a within subject design because you need more power to detect those physiological changes. So this is actually quite common. It's very difficult to detect those changes between groups. Uh, and so all participants would view all the PSA. Uh, they had to be above the age of 18, smoke at least five cigarettes a day for the last year. Um, we verified that, again, through biochemical verification um, and self-report. And interestingly, three people lied about their smoking behaviors just to participate to get the $30 per hour. So that's why we use biochemical verification. 74% uh, were male at uh, the age of 35. Can you believe it? What's that? Probably so. Well, that's an interesting comment 
So the design was a two smoky fuse present absent by two health threat higher than those. So participants randomly used three 30 second anti tobacco uh, PSAs in each of these smoky fuse life threat conditions, resulting in a total of 12. So they consented, and they verified that they were smoking, we verified. And then after some initial self report questions, they sat in the chair and a 10 second black screen appeared and they watched one of the 12 PSAs, answered questions about freedom, threat, anger, counter arguing, and pleasantness and arousal. And they did that 12 times for each video. Again, in random order to reduce carryover. Uh, and then they completed the man on the individual trait measure. And then we had them do a memory task going back to the question. Uh, the memory task contained um, audio content from the 12 videos, so two clips from each video. So there are 24 audio clips. And then we have really a library of PSAs, and we took audio clips from very similar PSAs, but PSAs, PSAs that they had not seen in the study. So there's 48 audio clips, and they sit there with the keyboard, and there were two seconds to leave, and we asked them without sacrificing accuracy to respond as quickly as possible if whether they had heard that content in the study, yes or no. And so that allows us to compute how well the information was encoded into memory, as well as some other measures. Then they had demographics or degree, and they did that in that order. Here are the dependent variables, threat, freedom, anger, counter arguing, that's reactive, unpleasantness, arousal, that's the LP1P, and the heart rate, and then the signal detection measures. If you can see that, um, so we sat on the other side of the one-way mirror. This is Daniela, she's one of my RAs. And they control the pace of the study. Um, in front of her is a 32-inch TV, an entertainment system we try to increase uh, ecological validity, it's still hard, no one watches TV this way. Um, but at any rate, they, it took, typically took participants about an hour to go through the study and survey. So the data, right, this is kind of the interesting part. So to try to uh, get you situated, uh, so again, this, these are our co-active messages, the condition of interest, and we compared it to the messages only showing smoking cues versus only showing threat versus the condition showing neither. So this is a pretty much a simple repeated measure to know it. And so we find that threat to freedom is highest for the message condition that had both message attributes. This immediately alarms me. Because you have to remember, this message condition was very similar to the other two, where we said it was message avoidance. But threat to freedom is part of reactive. And so then, if you look at anger, anger is highest for this condition versus the three others. And if you look at counter-arguing, counter-arguing was significantly higher than the freedom of condition. And so if you just run a simple linear regression, you see that threat to freedom significantly predicts increased anger and counter-argument for that message condition. Which suggests this is not message avoidance, as we'll see. This is psychological reaction. And perhaps in those prior studies, the smokers weren't avoiding it. But in fact, they're getting anger and counter-argument, as I observed during the debriefing session. And it's important to note that in those LC4MP studies, we only measure these variables. Right, in terms of self-report measures are the versus activation. And had we done that, we would have found that unpleasantness, unsurprisingly, is higher uh, for the co-active condition versus the other three, and so is arousal. And we would assume message, <coughs> message avoidance, right? And that's typically what's been assumed in, in terms of incentive processing using the lc 4 p So we see the self-report data really matches what we thought was happening. Here's the heart rate data, and it's quite clear. We see heart rate accelerates less, or even accelerates. This is probably the sympathetic nervous system activating in response to a threat for the co-acting messages. For messages that only had threat, right, negativity bias at work. It's not overly negative. People are attending to it and sustaining attention. For messages that show smoking cues, guess what? Smokers pay attention to messages that show smoking throughout the video. And if you can believe it, about 54% of anti-tobacco PSAs show smoking. Smoking versus smoking or boomer in fact. Uh, but here we see again that heart rate uh, acceleration, the sense of processing for this condition, which replicates those two other studies. In these two studies, though, we said it was message avoidance. In this middle panel, this is reactive, right? Which suggests how we measure reactive here. We may have found that this was actually a fight response rather than avoidance. So if they're allocating less resources to encoding the content, they shouldn't be able to really recognize or tell us what they recognize in a memory task. 
And if you look at accuracy in our recognition task, 53% accurate for that condition, which is significantly lower than messages only showing smoking, only showing threats, or in users. So we see, once again, the memory really corroborate with the heart rate data here. Recognition uh, is not always useful because participants can just say yes to everything. And so we can see signal detection of sensitivity and criterion bias. Um, and we see sensitivity is pretty much a ratio of hits to false alarms. And we see that it mirrors the recognition data as well. Um, and then we also can see the criterion bias. This is really how confident or how liberal they are in their decision making. And they should be less liberal if they're unsure of what they saw and what they didn't. And these data also suggest that, right? So all three of the memory um, uh, outcomes support the heart rate as well. So going back to the question of who fights, who sleeps, which one are you? Well, we ran uh, a mediation model uh, with a um, thousand bootstrap simulations. And we took the risk taker, and we found that the more you're a risk taker, the more you get angry. And the more you try to argue, the more you fight. If you look at the risk avoider, we find that being a risk avoider is not associated with anger. And in fact, if you're a risk avoider, there's a negative association with trying to argue. The more you're a risk avoider, the less likely you are trying to argue or fight. And so we see support for those who fight and those who flee. So right in this study, at least, we hypothesized that reactants provide this model that's widely used in our field with the appropriate measures to discriminate fight or flight responses. And results supported this prediction, right? So it's kind of when it is the first to, to integrate these two theories in a meaningful, cohesive, cohesive way. And we see that smokers who were high in risk taking were more likely to, um, I'm sorry, who were more avoidant, were more likely to withdraw from the message, characterized by low anger and counter argument. Those who are risk takers were more likely to experience reactions, get angry, and counter argue. So again, both reactants and message avoidance re resulted in those same outcomes. It's unpleasant, it reduced attention and memory of a message, um, and again, all of these indicators of attention processing. So in terms of at least theories, we'll get to practical implications in a second. Future reactive studies should maybe keep in mind that not all people get angry and kind of argue. Some people may just be risk averse and avoid. The LC4 and P, if you're interested in doing this type of research, we recommend um, and Andy recommends with us that we should include additional measures in order to get a more uh, broader picture of the type of response that is occurring during attentive processing. In terms of practical implications, I mentioned earlier that's the goal of this research. Well, what we know is message producers <coughs> should avoid attempting smoking and anti tobacco PSAs and even anti vaping PSAs because they actually elicit the urge to smoke or even vape. And, and even though those messages capture attention and sustain attention, we're creating boomerang effects by listening to urge. Uh, message producers should not uh, depict smoking cues with threat content, as we saw here, that results in attentive processing, these proactive messages. So based off kind of these series of studies, the recommendations would be for message producers to only depict disgust or health threats or fear or deception. One attribute that's negative. You don't want to make two negative attributes that might get to the point where it's too aversive. And you don't want to throw in anything that's really positive, like smoking, because that may actually result in uh, reactions and attention processing. So right now, uh, in my lab, where we started data collection this past Monday, we're actually looking at non-physiological measures. So we look at secondary task reaction times. And we're interested in how counter arguments might influence SDRP or response latency. Um, looking at key reactivity studies on vaping PSAs, we're, we've actually found one study that's showing vaping PSAs not only elicits urge to vape, it actually elicits urge to smoke traditional cigarettes, kind of crossover cravings. Um, we've done research on polysubstance cue cravings. Um, unsurprisingly, but maybe novel though, we found that if you show undergraduates pictures of marijuana, Craving for marijuana increases, but when it's paired with pizza, craving for marijuana increases above and beyond these pictures of marijuana, or when it's paired with alcohol, and so forth. So the idea of depicting multiple substances at one time may actually elevate craving above and beyond.
Brian, you must have an education in special terms of advertisement marketing. One question I always get, really interesting stuff, Russell, do they actually work, right? Do these messages actually work? All of these studies are controlled, tightly controlled experimental studies. I would like to do some type of ecological momentary assessment where people have like a palm pilot and receive the videos and watch them throughout a time period. And you can all see how many doses, <coughs> how many times they need to be exposed to these videos um, for persuasion to occur. Um, I think it's important to note that <coughs> mapping specific thoughts to physiological systems is not a wise idea. Okay, so even though counter arguing seems to be what's happening here, it's possible that participants are just thinking about an exam or lunch or picking up their kids, right? And it, in both of those cases, that's internal processing. You know the counter arguing data support what happened here. We can't be sure. Um, in most cases, we typically do with reaction studies thought listening tasks. Um, we measure counter arguing through a three item index uh, after each message, but typically through thought listening. In that case, we'd have to do a thought listening task 12 times, and that would take, uh, that'd be a very long study. Um, I'm also interested in the role of response efficacy, so thinking about different models in our field. Um, next to the parallel process model, when we perceive a threat, we experience fear. But if we feel like we can change or control that threat, we might just accept the message. But when we have a low response efficacy, I mean, we don't feel like we have the tools, we're un unable to do what the message is recommending, that is what may be resulting in message rejection. Questions for this group um, in particular. So the media psychology literature, believe it or not, there's not a lot of studies on aging populations and message processing using psychophysiological measures. Um, and so I guess um, one point for a, a conversation here would be, what PSAs might, might we see like an aging population resist? or potentially respond to? What type of content would that be that we can identify and empirically test in terms of making a future recommendation? Um, and then maybe not even in terms of incentive processing, what are general messages we would like an aging population to attend to and remember just in general? And strategies for those things. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go back to that slide, but actually those are real, real questions I have for the group. Um, and so that's it, if you guys have any questions